Hi everyone, I'm Andrew and Hellboy's back in town, Hellboy's back in town. We're here all week. The new reboot is the latest evolution of one of indie comics' greatest success stories, a creator-owned epic that's quietly endured for decades. But how did Mike Mignola's quirky creation become such a pop culture staple? What made Guillermo del Toro's films so effective? And how will the David Harbour Hellboy differ from what came before? Cuddle your kitty, chow down on some pancakes, and rev up your red right hand because this is the true story of Hellboy. Alan Moore best describes Mike Mignola's art style as German expressionism meets Jack Kirby, and his dark moody drawings made a major impact on Batman's death in the family and Gotham by Gaslight storylines. By the early 90s, he was one of comics' rising stars and ready to make an impact with a creation all his own. So let's start with Hellboy's Inferno origin. In 1991, the prestigious Salt Lake City Comic Con needed drawings for their collectible pamphlet, so Magnolia contributed a quick sketch that he jokingly labeled Hellboy. The hulking demonic beast bears little resemblance to the hard-boiled detective we know today, but even in his early stage, elements like the shaved horns are still present. Mignola had no intention of fleshing out the character into his own series, though he continued to draw him for random commissions, like this Italian magazine cover that debuted his rocky right hand. Does it do anything special? Yeah, it smashes things real good. But when he heard about a creator-owned initiative going on at indie publisher Dark Horse Comics, he decided to develop his idea further. He originally envisioned Hellboy as a team book, but when he couldn't come up with enough catchy names, he turned it into a solo act instead. Mignola based Hellboy's lovably gruff demeanor on his father, a world-weary Korean War veteran and cabinet maker who would regale his son with deadpan renditions of gruesome injury stories. Oh. He actually pitched the concept to DC at first, and they loved it, but they were hesitant to publish a comic with hell in the title. They were fast, they were fierce, they were fuel-injected furies, they were hot rods from heck. Though I guess John Constantine Hellblazer gets an exception, but pick your battles, DC. Robin! Even at Dark Horse, the higher-ups were hesitant to let an untested artist write his own book, so they hired John Byrne to contribute to the script instead. As a result, the first Hellboy story is a solid, but slightly weird start. Magnola's moody art is astonishing, but the dialogue just doesn't quite sound right, especially Byrne's forced attempt at an awkward catchphrase. Well, it's all for you. I'm a devil man. Born in hell, it's all for you. <laughs> Magnola quickly took up the writing reins himself and created a vast, expansive world that mixed the horror of H.P. Lovecraft with the charm of a buddy cop comedy with its cast of killer characters, like the pyrokinetic Liz Sherman and Hellboy's fishy friend, Abe Sapien, the book quickly blossomed into its own universe with BPRD. And soon, as it always does, Hollywood came a calling. Let's look at Hellboy's big debut at the movies. It's no surprise that Guillermo del Toro is a massive geek. His entire output is shaped by mythology, monster magazines, and of course, comic books. I uh, thought it was visually so rich and so powerful, and I wanted to try and translate some of the characters and the images to film. Mignola's art had long been an inspiration for the Mexican director, and when he first read Hellboy, he quickly became his favorite superhero. For years, Hellboy was del Toro's dream project. He pitched it as early as 1998, but back then, comic book movies were still considered box office poison. and producers wanted to make drastic changes, like making Hellboy a human who transforms into a demon. But after the director delivered at the box office with Blade II, the studio finally greenlit his relatively faithful vision. Del Toro made some changes of his own, like giving Abe Sapien psychic powers and transforming Liz into a love interest. But he was more or less on the same page as Mignola, and when the two met to discuss casting, they agreed to say their perfect Hellboy at the same time. Naturally, they both said, Ron Perlman. Hey, hey, hey. They're playing our son. Come on, champ. Let's go fight some monsters. 
the actor who was no stranger to elaborate prosthetics jumped at the chance. You must leave. No. And endured a grueling four hour ordeal to transform into the world destroyer. That's four hours every day. Hellboy was released to critical acclaim and modest financial success. Remind me why I keep doing this? Rotten eggs and the safety of mankind. Ah. Although it made most of its money on the home video market. The same thing happened with 2008's Hellboy 2 The Golden Army. Although the box office was less spectacular than the first, thanks to an absolutely stacked lineup of super powered competition. It's not about what I want, it's about what's fair! Little film, Dark Knight, ever heard of it? <sighs> F you. Also, Iron Man, F you. And the Incredible Hulk. And the Incredible Hulk. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> Still, Guillermo del Toro was gung-ho to complete his trilogy and force Hellboy to reckon with his destiny as the great beast of the apocalypse. But sadly, life got in the way. Del Toro's career exploded after Hellboy and Pan's Labyrinth, and for years he was busy with a variety of projects that were trapped in development hell. Like Halo and his infamous attempt to make the Hobbit trilogy. Between those two train wrecks and actual movies like Pacific Rim, where is my goddamn shoe? Del Toro's commitments made it impossible for him to work on Hellboy 3. And when he finally had free time, studios just weren't interested anymore. See, in 2004 and 2008, it was okay for a movie to make most of its money on DVD. But in today's drastically different marketplace, where home media sales have utterly tanked, thanks Netflix, without a billion dollar box office guarantee, no one would give Del Toro the money to finish his story. Granted, Things might be different now that Guillermo snagged an Oscar for his Abe Sapien inspired fishy romance. But sadly, it was too late. Because Hellboy was already on the road to rebirth. While Hellboy was blazing on the big screen in awesome animated adaptations and tie in video games back in comics, Mignola was still hard at work on his saga. Unfortunately, as the franchise grew, Mignola couldn't keep creating Hellboy single handedly. So, beginning in 2005, other illustrators began to handle the art duties. Still, the book kept on kicking, or <laughs> punching, <laughs> along with spin offs, side stories, and fully canonical tie in novels, at least until Hellboy unceremoniously died in 2011, when his heart was torn out by an evil witch. But even death couldn't keep the lovable lunk down for long. The next year, Mignola returned to both writing and drawing duties with Hellboy in Hell to give his most famous creation a fitting send off. In the comics, anyway. With Hollywood, it's hard to keep a good IP down, and in the wake of the MCU, someone woke up and realized that the Mignola verse had a ton of franchise potential. When something got franchise potential, you gotta follow the money, baby. Mignola was originally hired to help write a sequel to the Del Toro trilogy. And while Guillermo was invited to produce, he didn't want to be involved unless he could contribute to the script. The crew also approached Ron Perlman to reprise his role, but he refused the offer once it became clear that Del Toro wouldn't be involved. It's a bummer, to say the least. But David Harbour, the grumpy sheriff from Stranger Things, is a solid pick to fill Hellboy's cloven hooves. So how do you kill this thing? Shoot it with fireballs or no. something? You summon an undead army uh, because, because... The entire reboot seems very extra, from Hellboy's scraggly new hair and divorced dad bod to the gory promise of its R rating. And it's an ambitious adaptation of Mignola's apocalyptic trilogy. We'll finally be seeing some old BPRD faves too, like Lobster Johnson and Ben Daimio. Though sadly, Doug Jones's Abe Sapien didn't make the cut. Still, with its renewed focus on a hard-hitting horror, the new Hellboy is shaping up to be a slightly different superhero flick. They will build statues of you made from the bones of your enemies. Don't take a shit ton of bones. Is it a bummer Del Toro never got to finish his trilogy? Do I miss Ron Perlman with every fiber of my being? Absolutely. But hey, if Spider-Man can survive half a dozen reboots, surely a hulking half-demon with a hankering for breakfast deserves another shot. Mike Mignola is a rare case in comics, a single creator with a unique vision who told a consistent story throughout two decades. God damn. But Hellboy is far bigger than one man. 
and he's simply too good a character to stay dead for long. Be sore in the morning. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm hella hyped for the new movie, but as much as we love David Harbour, we want to know who your dream fan cast is for Hellboy. Is it Arnold Schwarzenegger? Is it Winston Duke? Is it Dwayne Johnson? Leave a comment, let me know. Please subscribe to Now This Nerd, and if you see Abe Sapien, tell him I'm so, so sorry and I miss him so much.